Okay. That's working. Okay, so. All right. So we're good to go. Can you still hear? Yeah. No, we're yep. going to hear you now. Yes. Now it's fine. Yeah. Once it starts, it doesn't go away. <laughs> All right. So good. Hello. Good afternoon. Yeah. A little bit of, uh, you know, it's a trial and error. It's to see, you know, um, how are you? Are you able to, uh, you know, get over this? Are you okay? And you seem to do it really well. So uh, you're a pro. got dropped out of my class in the middle of a session and it felt to me like forever getting back in there. Excellent. I finally got back in and looked at the chat. It was really fun. Okay. Excellent. Okay. That was fun. And it's like, hmm, maybe he's missing it. And then what was great, and I just love them for this, is that they actually did continue talking about in the chat what it was we were discussing in class. So. Uh, yes, things definitely happen. Well, I had one experience when I was doing web conferencing, and uh, I actually got dropped out of my class in the middle of a session, and it felt to me like forever getting back in there. But when I finally got back in and I looked at the chat, it was really funny because my students sort of started realizing I was no longer in the class, and it's like, hmm, I think Anita's missing. Or, and then what was great, and I just love them for this, is that they actually just continued talking about in the chat what it was we were discussing in class. So uh, yes, things definitely happen. And uh, you, as Nellie says, you just have to deal with it. So I'm just going to assume everybody can hear me, and you'll let me know in the chat uh, if that's not the case. Uh, and as Nellie said, my name is Anita Zeidemans Boudreau. And I'm an associate professor in the College of Education at Pacific University. And we're located just outside of Portland in Oregon. And for those of you who don't know where that is, I'm located somewhere in the middle between Seattle and San Francisco. And most people know those points. So that's where I am in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, as Nelly has suggested, please add a chat uh, in the chat questions if you ever have any, and I'll rely on Nelly to help me out to monitor. Uh, it's a small space, and one of the things about I find using this technology is sometimes it's hard to keep track of all of the things that are going on in the chat, and so uh, what I do is I usually ask a student to be my monitor because I don't usually have the luxury of a facilitator like Anneli. So usually it's a, a good way is just to get a student to help you out. So welcome everybody. Uh, also before I continue, I just would like to thank Nelly for her wonderful work. I'm so impressed by what she's been doing here. It really takes online teaching up to another level. Uh, I know she must have put countless hours into this and so kudos Nelly this is great a great experience and it's been exciting to see all of the different people attending from all over the place so thanks for that so let me just get into this I'm going to skip to oh, there we go I thought I did fix it so let me just look at the talking points for today uh, today, I just would like to share my experience of what happened when I decided to move outside of my comfort zone, my learning management system, to start exploring integrating social media into my teaching and learning. Uh, and um, how this experience actually led me to get interested in today's topic, which is this idea of how do we personalize virtual learning Space. So along the way, I'm going to uh, provide some definitions just to make sure that we're all on the same page. We have a common understanding of some of these concepts. Uh, so we'll look at, at some of these different topics. And by the end of today, my hope is that I will have given you some food for thought on how you might become more proactive and intentional in the way you use technology to personalize your online learning environment. For your teaching, your learning, 
also for your professional development. And also that you can start hopefully using social media to infuse your philosophy of teaching in your environment because you'll have more flexibility to, to bring in and choose the things that you want to, to choose. Okay. So let's start by setting a little context. And as I've written here, increased personalization that is, uh, has been afforded by social media, they are changing the way we use technology in our daily lives. And uh, we see this, any of you who have kids or if you watch young people, even if you look at your own practice, technology is impacting the way we live our lives. And so as educators and as, edu and as part of educational institutions, we really need to rethink how we use technology and how we create spaces uh, for using these tools for our teaching, for our program delivery, uh, for student learning, for access and content, and, the, and for communication. So, um, uh, it, I just find that this is a really exciting time to be an educator. It is an exciting time to be an educator, isn't it? Well, some of you might think, well, is she crazy? It's never been more crazy to be an educator. There are all kinds of things going on in our field. Uh, now we're supposed to be more sensitive to the different needs of students in our classroom. K-12 educators, of course, have had to deal with this for a long time. Increasingly in higher education, we're seeing more uh, challenges coming into our classrooms. How do we meet the needs of our diverse learners? And then on top of it all, on top of uh, having to be experts in our field and knowing how to teach well. Now we've got to think about not only how are we going to keep up with all of the new technologies that are out there, but how are we going to figure out which tools to use into our practice and how to do that effectively. So it is an exciting time, but it's not without challenges. And I don't pretend to say that it isn't difficult. It is challenging. But the reason why I say it's an exciting time to be an educator is because we have never been more connected. We have never had access to more resources. These tools, although they bring challenges, they are also the deliverers of great change and great opportunities for us to reach outside of our little institutions, meet with other people in the world, engage with other educators, to find that tribe that Cheryl was talking about the other day. I really like that, that, um, that metaphor. Uh, you know, to find people who can help us to become better educators and in the process for us to learn and, and develop professionally and personally. So it's a great time to be an educator. This MOOC is a great example of using social media and learning management systems to, to bring people together. And um, I think for those of you who are fans of Marshall McLuhan, uh, as devices go down in cost, as access through the satellite technology improve, we, uh, in our human history, we have never had so many people have access to so much knowledge uh, and information. And that global village, that digitally connected global village that Marshall McLuhan talked about is definitely uh, a reality. And as more people get connected in, we will achieve that at some point, hopefully, we'll have more equal education and access for everybody on the planet. So let's move on and think about some terms. So social media, let me just sort of describe what I mean by social media. You'll see here that I've pulled a definition. So social media are defined as a group of internet-based applications that build on the ideological and technological foundations of Web 2.0. By Web 2.0, we mean those blogs, wikis, social network sites, content communities, virtual communities, immersive worlds, media sharing, communication tools, all of these different things that would be considered Web 2.0. And social media, because of these Web 2.0 tools, they allow for the creation and exchange of user-generated content. So I'd like to just highlight uh, ideological uh, in, in this definition, because what Web 2.0 has done for us, or Web 2.0, depending on how you call it, it has really taken us out of what was previously this dominant behavioral design 
uh, some people refer to it as Web 1.0, a very behaviorist uh, paradigm where it was more about transmitting uh, information that you were the expert uh, and that it was a very hierarchical kind of model, uh, formal learning situation. And now in Web 2.0, social media really allowed those of us who are into constructive, constructivist kinds of approaches to collaborate, create uh, environments that are more active, that are more student-centered. Uh, they're more horizontal rather than vertical in their structure. Um, and they support this not only formal learning, but they also can blur the line into informal learning and even lifelong learning because these tools are in the hands of everybody. So for the first time in our history, the everyday man has access to these tools. We are in the driver's seat. We get to control. We get to personalize. Um, we get to decide how we want to use these tools. So in addition to these great tools that we have, these social media, as educators, uh, we need to think about how we're going to use these tools and what kind of environment we want to use these tools in. And when I think about learning space or uh, creating your learning environment in a face-to-face -face setting, I always think about elementary educators because elementary educators really understand the importance of environment for learning. Uh, any of you who are uh, elementary educators might be nodding your head. For some reason, we get it right. We understand that kids, learners need a rich environment. They need something that's visually appealing. They need to be part of the environment. Uh, as elementary educators, we share our students' work so it becomes more of a shared learning environment. And then for some reason, by the time we get to high school, and very much so by the time we get into higher education, we just seem to think that focusing on those dynamics is more important, and we put less value in on creating the learning environment. Now, of course, there are lots of educators who do continue to create a rich learning environment, but I think this is a general trend that we see. What we do know from the research that's coming out on online learning is that one of the most common complaints that learners have is that they feel isolated, they feel alone out there in virtual space. Any of you who have been in the online environments, traditional online learning, where maybe it's more about just posting responses to questions and maybe responding to each other, it's not very active, you feel isolated, you feel like you're alone out there. And one of the ways that we can think about this is to, to really look at how we design our virtual space. Just like that elementary teacher, how can we create a rich online environment? And what I've pulled up here is uh, um, a definition from Oplinger. I don't know if that's how you pronounce her name. But she edited a really interesting book called Learning Spaces. And what I like about her definition is that she's giving us a context that embraces face-to-face but also online. And so she talks here about learning spaces as blurring the boundary between face-to-face -face and virtual environments. And that uh, learning spaces can continuously adapt to the learner's needs and context. It's fluid, flexible, network, and it brings together formal and informal learning activities. So in higher education and increasingly in uh, K-12 context, learning spaces are defined by the virtual learning environments that are used by our institution. And so what I've put up here is just for clarification, uh, just to try and distinguish what is the difference between a virtual learning environment and say a course management system or a learning management system. We do hear uh, CMS and LMS used interchangeably. There are subtle differences, but basically if you think of a virtual learning environment as this umbrella term that just describes the software system that we use for education, uh, and course management and learning management systems as being ways to uh, actually manage the learning or the content. So as I've got here, it's a comprehensive tool it supports communication, online delivery, curriculum mapping, assessment, student tracking. It's all within a secure workspace. So it's a very defined, uh, structured 
learning space that has been designed and developed by other you know companies and things like that and some of you might have experiences in different kinds of learning management systems desire to learn blackboard uh, moodle of course being the focus of of uh, this uh, this uh, MOOC here uh, but with that structure, there are certain constraints. So uh, although a learning management system is a great tool, and I highly recommend it for people who are early, new, novice in, in teaching online, and I'm actually really impressed with how they've grown over the years. They've changed a lot since I started using them uh, back as a doctoral student in, in the mid-90s. Um, there are some constraints, and I've just I think it's important to, to look at some of those limitations. Uh, but the benefits, let's start with the good stuff. The benefits are seamless integration with the institutional information management system. It's really nice every term to just go into your course shell and there are your students because as soon as they enrolled in the course, they just automatically got put into your course, um, into your online course. Uh, they provide security and structure. They, as I mentioned before, you know, student enrollment, tracking, grading, communication, great tools all within, uh, all within one secure system. And they provide a structure for you to build your course elements, your outlines, your units, your assignments, uh, to upload your materials, uh, a place for your assessments and your grading. Another thing I've noticed over the years and in looking at some of the changes in this uh, 2.5 version of Moodle, They've gotten really good at allowing for uh, social media integration. Some of the tools have their own version. Uh, like I know Moodle had an option you could bring in a blog or you could bring in uh, a wiki. But now they're actually uh, even more friendly to you being able to link in from the outside. The best version, I would leave that to Nelly to answer, but I, my sense is that this 2.5 version of Moodle is actually really powerful, and, and I, I don't know it really well. I'm looking forward to exploring it a bit further. Well, let's look a bit at the limitations. This is one of the, uh, the arguments against this sort of virtual learning environment, is that it perpetuates that dominant behavioral paradigm that I referred to earlier. It reinforces the hierarchical institutional practice because the institution is implementing it. So on the one hand, the institution is trying to provide a structure for, uh, instru uh, for teachers, especially if they don't have a lot of familiarity with online learning. But in the process, what they do is they tend to, and this I've seen this vary across institutions. Some IT departments, are very rigid about how they want you to use the technologies. And part of that is because they have to support everybody in the whole institution on the same platform. So they tend not to like it too much when you go outside or you, know, you try a different version or you're using tools that they don't want to support. So typically, your information technology department will determine what features you can use in your learning management system. And they get to turn on and off different features. But the next level down, why it, it can be hierarchical is from that point, the instructor then determines what features they want to use, which in turn uh, dictates what the students are able to use. And in this whole process, the students really don't have any control or input. Uh, learning management systems are, tend to be limited in, in your ability to personalize the environment. So they're institution-centric, and they tend to focus more on academic versus real-world use. And someone like me in teacher education, I started to find this a little bit constraining. And my main complaint, really, was that I, when, especially when I was teaching education technology, is that these students were having to learn how to use my institution's learning management system, and yet when they graduate and they go into the classroom, they would not have access to that learning management system. Now, as I've mentioned, there are a lot more um, K-12 uh, settings that are starting to implement learning management systems, but it's a big difference from this new generation of social media that are out there available to everybody, and so many of them free of cost. It was hard not to get ex 
excited about these changes that were going out there in the outside world, outside of academia, and not to want to participate in that. Uh, I started yearning, longing to have more control of my learning environment. And I wanted my students to have tools that they could use when they were out there in the classroom. In short, I wanted to explore this idea of personalizing my learning environment. And so here you'll see I've just put up a definition of what a personal learning environment is. I think it's fairly obvious, but there's some interesting discussions on what those are. Uh, here we've got Downs's version of uh, his definition, a collection of systems and tools that allow engagement in distributed environments across networks of people, services, and resources. And the power of personal learning environments is that they allow users to actively construct their understanding and experience in a social environment using those Web 2.0 tools, those social media, and to take control of and manage their own learning and or work. So this is where I wanted to go in my teaching. And this is why I started thinking I needed to go beyond uh, the learning management system in my, my institution. I've just thrown this up here as an example of a personal learning environment. I don't know if any of you have uh, have uh, played with iGoogle, but it's just a great way. You can use gadgets or widgets and just bring in what you want, and it just becomes, you can set it as your home page, and you come here, and everything you want is here. I've got my picture of my family, my Google reader going, my Spanish word of the day, I'm trying to learn Spanish, uh, my important bookmarks. And the great thing is I can create different pages based on different themes. And so at one point, I've even um, played with creating a page for a course. And you can share this, or you can make it private. Um, and you teach Spanish also. Great. They're fun, right? So there are a lot of interesting things you can do with social media to personalize your own learning environment. Uh, for iGoogle, um, I, I think it's actually just part of your, if you have a Google account, you can just uh, actually go to iGoogle and set something up. They're a lot of fun. So anyway, back to my story. How did I actually make this move? Because if you remember at the beginning, uh, I set up this scenario and I said that this is an excellent time to be an educator. And I also set up a counterpoint, which is, well, how do you keep abreast of all of the changes how do you know which tools to use? And how do you know how to use them well? And that's the exact question that I started with when I decided, finally, I wanted to make this transition from just using my learning management system to uh, creating uh, learning personal learning environments using uh, social media. And what I did was action research. And I have to say, as Nelly did, action research is tra it transforms your practice. It really does. But what I really enjoyed uh, with when I thought about this, it wasn't just me who was intimidated by technologies, or it wasn't just it wasn't just I wasn't the only one who had these questions about how do I keep up, how do I know which one to use. My teachers, my student teachers, had the same questions too. So I decided that I would do a participatory action research. So what did that mean? I brought in my students. I sat them down. I said, this is what I'd like to do. Uh, it's going to be different. It might be difficult. But I think we could create some community around this and really explore what some of these tools are, uh, how they can be used for personalization, and how we could co-construct this, uh, this environment together, something that's going to hopefully meet all of our needs and, and result in a, a really great learning experience that will also improve our literacy skills. So basically throughout the process, this is what I pulled together at the end of one of the courses that, that, uh, that I did. And I pulled together the different tools to use, and I kind of ask myself this question, well, what have I created here? Is this a virtual learning environment? Is it a learning management system? Is, or is it a personal learning environment? How would I actually describe what we created together? And this is where um, I sort of decided that what we had created was this, this hybrid. It was a hybrid 
that brought in some traditional behavioral elements of a virtual learning environment or a learning management system, but also uh, linked in different things. So as you can see here, at the center, I had what would be considered the learning management system. This is where we have the course document, we have the calendar, everything around organizing, the things that we need to know about what we're doing in this course, wh where we're going, what the direction is. But then around that, I started exploring these different tools. And one thing, we had a, a discussion, a blog discussion for a book that we were that we were looking at for the course. We used web conferencing, like this uh, environment here. We used uh, Adobe Connect. Uh, we had a wiki where we were putting projects and collaborative projects that the students were working on. And then on the uh, left side here, we had student blogs. And this was a, a significant actually change in, in what I did in this course where I started thinking about uh, assessment and uh, students needing to really practice in an authentic way how to use these tools. And so what we did is they created, each created their own blog and linked it in to this environment. And here's where they explored uh, and they were able to start assembling a sort of an e-portfolio that demonstrated mastery of, uh, of the different concepts. So we had created a personalized virtual learning environment that is a flexible infrastructure that supported the learning community via a network of linked, shared workspaces, resources, communications, and tools. And uh, I, I did write this up, and I have presented it, um, uh, and I've included that in the references for people who'd like to have a look. So looking at some insights gained uh, from this experience, and I'm now in my seventh year of this study. It's an iterative study. As I mentioned, I'm an action researcher. I actually can't imagine doing what I do without action research. Uh, but what some insights after these years of using this approach, both at the course level and at the program level, because I also happen to be a program coordinator, so I had the luxury of being able to implement this kind of personalized virtual learning environment at a programmatic level, um, is that this design, this combination of a, a, vir a virtual learning uh, environment or an LMS plus a personal learning environment and social media, it really supports this idea of flexible and emergent infrastructure and going back to what uh, Oblinger has defined as, as learning spaces, this really connects into her work, blurring that informal uh, versus formal learning. So learning, formal learning being what happens inside the classroom, inside school. But when you have these environments, you go home and you just, you sort of transition into this learning that becomes more informal, more self-directed. Um, the idea of this design also empowering students to take more ownership. It wasn't just me directing that traditional sort of, I'm the expert, I know everything, uh, you do what I say. It was more constructive as we were learning together and students were encouraged to take more ownership over what they were doing. The one thing I have learned though is that this shift requires, it requires a concept, it, it requires a paradigm shift. It requires that you change the way that you do your process. It requires that you change the way you think about teaching and learning. And uh, this conceptual shift, it's not just on the part of the instructor. As I learned after getting lots of feedback from my students over the years, it also it requires some conceptual shift on their part too. Uh, as an instructor, you have to learn how to relinquish control. And I've always thought of myself as a pretty open educator. I love a constructivist approach uh, to, to teaching and learning. And yet it took me a while to figure out that if I didn't give up control of that environment, uh, students wouldn't feel empowered to, to step in and make it there. So I had to really rethink how much control that, that I was taking uh, over in this virtual space. Uh, students they had to rethink how they were learning. And it was interesting because I did in the beginning, I've gotten better at it, but I did have students who thought, well, you know, 
why can't you just tell me what I have to learn? And, and you know, why, why are we changing things up? You know, they, it took them a while to see the value. Um, yes, we do tell rather than allow. Uh, it, it took them a while to see the value of, of this kind of learning experience. But by the end of it, overwhelmingly, students really appreciated it. And many students would say, why can't this be what learning is like in other classes as well? Um, using the participatory inquiry approach uh, or participatory action research, I can't speak about it highly enough. Uh, it helps you document the process. And what's really important about us, those of us who are learning how to integrate technology, you can only do it one step at a time. Otherwise, it's too overwhelming. And what if you use action research, it makes you more intentional about exploring different tools. You decide what tools you're going to use. You decide how you're going to, um, how you're going to use them. And you document the process. And I always tell my teacher candidates that teachers do action research. They just don't always know it. And one of the things teachers tend not to do in their action research is they tend not to take it to its full extension. So we all, as educators, address problems of practice. K-12, higher ed, K-12 especially, you know, things come up. You've got to figure out, how am I going to reach the student? Or I'm noticing this in my classroom. Problems of practice come up all the time, and teachers figure out uh, strategies for how to address those problems. That's action research. What teachers often don't do, however, is at the end of trying out whatever that implementation or that intervention was, at the end of it, they tend not to take the time to sit down and reflect and process what they learned. If you use action research intentionally, it takes you to the full iteration. At the end, it helps you document the process. And at the end, it sort of says, OK, it's time now to sit down and think about what did I learn? And what would I do differently the next time so it prepares you for that next iteration? And that's the power, I think, of an actual research approach. Using participatory research, in other words, involving your students in the process, just makes it even much that much better it just takes it to another level because you're doing it with your students you're modeling for them what inquiry is all about you're acknowledging to them hey I don't have all the answers you're making it transparent you're saying we're learning this together but it also engages them because now you're giving them a chance to really get involved in their own learning so these are some of the insights that I, I um, gained from doing this research. And when I think about this notion of personalized virtual learning spaces, um, well, what the research has also the tools we use, but the environments that we create within which those tools are being used. So going back to that elementary teacher, we need, and for reasons I mentioned before, too, that online learning is different from face-to-face. -face. We need to be very intentional in the way that we create our online learning spaces. Um, and personalizing a virtual learning space in the way that I have just outlined, it does allow for a flexible, emergent virtual infrastructure. It, it adapts to the learning community's needs. It supports a distributed shared network, uh, and it allows um, you to co-construct with your learners based on their needs and their goals. Okay, so that sort of just summarizes where I am in my thinking about virtual learning spaces. OK, so how do we do this? How do we start? Uh, well, as I mentioned before, using participatory action research and one step at a time, even if you start with your learning management system, get really comfortable with that, and then start by bringing in one social media tool, whatever feels comfortable for you. Because we are stressed, we do have a lot on our plate. And if we feel too overwhelmed by technology, our tendency will be not to want to do anything. So you need to take a step based on how you feel. Uh, you need not to be shy or nervous about tapping into the expertise of your students. That's why you do it as a community. You do it with them. It's amazing how much 
uh, how much more comfortable it can be to learn in a social environment with you without just like this move we're learning from each other you can learn you can establish a learning community with your students so what I would say about uh, where to start is that you, you need to create some sort of map in the same way that when we're starting to work on developing a course we determine the content we outline maybe some course themes that we're going to use and then from that we develop our scope and sequence for our course design you should think about what how do I want my online environment and if you're doing blended then you create a map that includes your face-to-face -face and your online environment but what do I want my learning environment uh, to look like and I think it's important to note that this is not a deterministic map it's not only Think of the expression, all roads or many roads lead to Rome. Okay, what it is, it's sort of a, a, a sketch of that sort of identifies where you want to go and outlines some possible routes for how you might get there. But as we know, there are lots of different ways to get places. And the beauty of this is that it, you allow for it to be flexible enough because your students might end up taking it in a direction that you never imagined. So if you map out things, the things that you want to be thinking about that are maybe are more structured are the things that you would do in your learning management system. Right? You need to have a space. Your students need to know enough information so that they know how to engage in this environment. So you need to set up some structure, but you uh, need also to give them some flexibility in how they want to engage uh, how they maybe they don't want to create a blog for their personal learning environment maybe they want to use a wiki or something else it shouldn't really matter what they use so much um, but that you allow them to engage in some tools uh, that that they want to use and you can co-construct this this environment together so this is just kind of a map of some of the different um, tools that we use in in my course um, you can see tying together that in the center, the core, the heart being that learning management system that provides the structure. But around that, this could be very loose and flexible. And what you use at the beginning of a course might not be the same as what you use at the end, or maybe it will. Uh, but just embracing that chaos or that sort of embracing the feeling of if you're going to be outside perhaps of your comfort zone. but if you have a shared goal together and you know where you want to go in the course that actually it'll probably just work out really well the transparency i think is a key part of that because your students need to you need to get buy-in from them and that's why the participatory aspect is so important okay so i'm actually going to stop there uh, because uh, i have some other things to share but before i go on to that i i think i've given you a lot to think about and I'm curious to hear whether or not people have questions or comments uh, I'd love to hear if people have tried similar things and what their experiences have been um, so I'll just give you a few minutes to maybe type in, in the you. chat thank you thank you so much that was uh, amazing I think you're allowed if, to use your uh, voice add in the chat sure, questions so. comments um, whatever is comfortable for you wish, and if you'd like we can give you the mic so you can also and I'll uh, just, speak. Uh, that this is great. the hard part when you're so in a well. virtual environment because okay, two seconds feels like an eternity but as we know good education practice you need to include your wait time so I won't be impatient, and I'll see if people actually have something uh, that I they'd see, like I to. I see that Alfonso is going to um, share. Do we have to learn how to use Moodle? No, on the contrary. <laughs> this is going beyond. <laughs> it's going beyond the LMSs, the course management system. It's going beyond, actually, beyond. And the if people don't have any comments, I can certainly go on to. I have a couple what, of slides uh, left, but I just thought I this might mention. be a good time to. It's going uh, to your own personal learning environment. It's you. A reflective and, pause. Um, your experiences. So, um, I think how I would also respond to that, Alfonso. Something around virtual learning environment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, it's interesting. They're really, I, and they have grown, they have evolved so much since the beginning. Because I think companies now are realizing that 
only supporting this behavioral tradition paradigm. Yeah. It's not going to work in today's context with social media. They're going to lose us if they restrict us too much. But what's beautiful about So um, I think how I would also respond to that, Alfonso, is to say if you are new to online teaching, a learning management system is going to be your best friend. They're really, I mean, and they have grown, they have evolved so much since the beginning because I think companies now are realizing that only supporting this behavioral traditional paradigm is not going to work in today's context of social media. They're going to lose us if they restrict us too much. But what's beautiful about a learning management system is that, um, is that it provides a structure. So if you've never used this before, it's going to be your best friend. And it's interesting because I started using learning management systems. I think the first one I used was first class at U of T. Then we went to WebCT, which was bought up, I think, by Blackboard. Um, when I came to Pacific, they were using Blackboard. Now they're using Moodle. There's desire to learn. There, um, yeah, Moodle is, has definitely become very popular. and. The premise, I think, the developers of Moodle, and Nelly probably knows more about this than I do, but my understanding is that they see themselves as uh, having created a more constructivist, uh, supportive environment, uh, and that it was developed by educators who felt too constrained by some of the other, the other programs. But you don't have to use Moodle. Uh, you don't have to use an LMS. Um, but a learning management system can be a nice core, as I mentioned, to your course. And as you see here in this visual, at the center, you need to provide structure, not only for your students, but for yourself too, right? We can't, although I think if you look at MOOCs and open learning, uh, the idea is that it's totally out there. The reality in our educational institutions is that we need some structure. Um, very few of us have the luxury of being able to just do an open, a, a MOOC kind of thing uh, like Nellie's doing here. But even if you look at Nellie's design, she has at the core that learning management system, which happens to be Moodle. So whatever works for you is what you put in the middle. I've used a Google site as my learning management system before at the core. You could use a blog. But the value of those learning management systems, as I said, is that if you have one in your institution, everything becomes a lot easier in terms of managing uh, your courses and you know getting them enrolled things like that it provides a structure but you can also link in some of these social media into your uh, your learning management uh, so I hope that sort of addressed that question yeah yeah I would say uh, Thomas yes uh, you can use whatever you want that's the beauty of these things so if you want if you like in my situation, I had, what, some seven or so years using a learning management system. I felt ready to go outside of that and to, uh, and to use social media. So I used a Google site. Uh, and basically, when I looked at what I created, it was very much like a learning management system. The difference being is that I had to manage the you students know, because I, I didn't have an information of, uh, system ago, at the university that just automatically to, populated uh, my courses. With, um, and I found nice yeah, I nice, and what's interesting too together. is that you might this change it. I've also used the blog as my learning management really, system. Really, it really, old, as you start playing by, uh, with these tools, the you start realizing what the strengths you know, what the limitations and the strengths are uh, of each of these tools, and you start so figuring really out old. how you want to use them. You know, nice net. I'm not even familiar with that one. <laughs> yeah. We can extend the time. Early days, you know, and so important, right? We have to, uh, and now we've come, I mean, it. social I mean, like, media just like has taken us to a completely anything. different level, you know. Okay. Um, we started and so, late. you know, I, it's yeah. been interesting using WizIQ because I wasn't familiar with that, and it looks like they really try to promote flexible use uh, across institutions, organizations, and even just individual teachers, Facebook, you know. Short. So. so were there any other questions? Should I just... 
I think I have uh, about four minutes here. Uh, so shall I take you to my next level of thinking? Sorry? Sure. Okay. Just just people of interest. <laughs> um, what do you think about FB? Now, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar. What does FB mean? Facebook. Oh, of course. Hello. That's an interesting one. You know, uh, I because I go to technology conferences all the time. I have been to a few. Uh, sessions on Facebook and people who are doing research on whether or not this is a good thing. Of course, there's a lot of discussion about it. Uh, one session that I remember seeing, their outcomes, what they, students, uh, and I think this is echoed a lot um, in, in other places too, is that students tend not to be as interested when you use Facebook because they see that as uh, encroaching on their personal space. And I have to say that as an educator, I've always been a bit tentative. I'm not a huge user of Facebook. I'm actually more interested in it from a social scientist point of view. But I do have an account. And I, and I have had situations where students have wanted to connect with me. And it feels a bit awkward, right? You, you kind of blurring that personal and it, it, it gets weird. So although I think there's some teachers who would say, hey, I've used it really well, um, there's a lot of, like some students who feel they don't want to. And actually, now you've reminded me, the ECAR uh, study just came out. And if I recall correctly, one of the, the findings, uh, you know, that they, because this is like they, they survey thousands of undergraduate students around their technology use and around how they see their teachers using technology. And if I recall correctly, there was one element that said they did not feel like teachers um, being in their personal space like Facebook. Having said that, as educators, and I don't know, has anybody played with this thing called Edmodo? Is it Edmodo or Edgimodo? So what it is, is a really interesting app a lot of educators are using. You hate it. <laughs> But the idea, I think, is kind of interesting. It's this notion of taking social networking and bringing it into the classroom. I've never used it, but I've, I'm curious about it because I've wondered if it might be a nice alternative to using Facebook. Now, apparently, the power of it is that you can create, use social networking within the privacy of your own environment. You can actually... Um, you know, you can put barriers or limitations on who has access. Uh, so a lot of educators like that because Facebook is so out there and open and um, they like having a little more of a protected, secure environment. Uh, when Ning was free, I loved Ning, and then they went and they started charging. And I just, well, that's a deal breaker for me because although I love Classroom 2.0, it's a great resource. Um, I stopped using names because I'm always trying to look for free options for my students, you know. Uh, yeah, Ning and Classroom 2.0 was excellent, and it was this idea of social networking. So getting back to the, the idea of social networking is great, uh, but I would say you could ask your students, especially in higher education where we have a little, we're working with adult learners, uh, you could say, well, how do you want to communicate? Do you want to use Facebook? Do you want to use chat? Uh, or use a variety of different things. Uh, some students will use Facebook on their own anyway to connect with each other, right? I know sometimes my daughters do. Um, yeah, you're right, Alfonso. And that's, a, that's something to keep in mind with all of these tools. And that is one of the things about social media is that uh, because they're tools that are out there in the public domain, uh, we need to think about that. The great thing about social networking tools, however, is that you can put filters on it. You can choose not to share. You can to choose to share. And in some cases, you can define who you share with. So for example, a, a social a networking tool, that I, a social bookmarking tool I love to use is Zigo. You can create a group. You can invite your class in there. And so it becomes a classroom discussion using a very powerful tool for accessing resources and, and analyzing and things like that. Yeah, tools disappear. That's always a drag. It's true. You know, these are examples that make, make 
for the argument for a learning management system that is supported within the institution. If there's a problem, you go to your tech people and you get help from them. Uh, when you go out into the social media world, you are a little more on your own. So that's just the downside of having all of this, this, this freedom. Yeah. Did we miss anything else? Yeah, you prefer the closed groups and Facebook, right, Marisol? I mean, and if your students are okay with that, then why not? You know, uh, some schools, K-12, I mean, we do have a lot of schools that, that put filters or blocks on some of these social media. Again, it depends. It varies. It depends on your environment. It depends on how open-minded your district is or your, you know, your administrators. You know, so... You, we have to be sensitive to all of those things. Uh, but my point here is that you need to think intentionally. You have to be thoughtful and proactive. Uh, because keep in mind, a lot of teachers, educators say to me, well, my students know more about technology than I do. And that may be true. But what they don't often have, which we do have, is we have perspective, we have insights, we have experience. Okay. And a lot of students, young people, they just consume tools. They don't think about how to use them in an educational context. What I'm advocating for here is that we think about this, we're proactive, we're intentional in our use of tools, because it's very easy to just consume tools without thinking about them, without thinking about how they impact your practice or all of these different things. So we as educators, we need to uh, set the bar we need to lead, we need to be critical in the way that we look at these tools. We need to be thinking about them, not just responding to the latest gadget. Um, and this is where I think the power comes for us as educators. No. Reading. It's very important. It's very important. And helping them to be critical about it. Yeah, I all of there's so much out there now on this issue of cyberbullying, all of these different things, you know. And we need to we need to get our students to think critically about that. Uh, we need to have discussions about that, what that looks like, what that means. And so, in this discussion I'm having with you today, uh, things might vary depending on your context. If you're a K-12, it might look a little different than if you're in higher ed, um, you know. So. Uh, that's why learning management system is more secure. It's a closed environment, but with closed environment comes closed limitations, right? You know, there's a balance. There's it's it's a continuum between um, how much control we want to have and how much control we want our students to have, and it's a hard it's hard to decide uh, what that is. And that actually, I'll, on that note, I will actually move to the next slide because this is, this is a work in progress. And what I've been trying to elaborate here is this, this continuum, this uh, continuum where on one side the instructor is in control and on the other side the learner is in control. Okay, so if you think about this as a spectrum or a continuum, and depending on where you are in the continuum or what you want, you might design your virtual learning space differently. So I've just got some sort of identifiers going down the left side. So if you really are the type of a traditional educator or you want to create a behavioral experience, a learning management system, or a very structured face-to-face -face environment, it's probably... Um, going to be sufficient for you, right? And when we think about the content that would go with that kind of course, it's probably more foundational, uh, might be lower levels, stuff on blooms, you know, more uh, remember, understand, apply kinds of things. It might be more about looking at best practices. Tends to be very formal, tends to emphasize assessment of, right? It's about uh, test results or um, outcomes based. Uh, your role is a lot of direct instruction, lecturing, uh, you're in charge. The student tends to comply more, just kind of demonstrate learning on tests, things like that. Close community, uh, 
and very loose quote unquote community. It's not really a community, it's more of a classroom of learners. Uh, and you're, so you're going to use your tech tools are going to be limited. If you are the type of person who wants to start blurring into more of a constructivist approach, then you've got to, I would argue, you have to open things up a bit. You know, uh, you might use the learning management system, but you might start bringing in some social media tools. And a great first step might be just saying, OK, I want you to have a, an e-portfolio. And in that e-portfolio, rather than just doing uh, traditional tests and assessment of learning, we're going to look at, at assessment for learning. We're going to look at achievements. We're going to look at exemplars, um, social, man social media. Uh, uh, is SM is a social media environment. Uh, so uh, and so you're blurring the formal and informal. Your role is to scaffold, facilitate, and to help the students actively explore. But it's within some structure. That's why you're still using a learning management system. But the learning community is a, it's it's starting to emerge. It's more flexible, and you can think about using unlimited sorts of tools. If you start thinking about a more connectivist, and if any of you saw Stephen Downs's uh, presentation, uh, he sort of lives a lot in this world, and he's done some work on personalizing uh, personal learning environments too. It's more open. It's more chaotic, right? It's more novel. It's often more beneficial for non-formal kinds of learning activities, and it tends to really emphasize learning as reflection, personal reflection. You're co-designing. So as you go along this continuum and you really open it up, it becomes more chaotic. But the more chaotic it is, the more chances you give the learners to learn the way they want to, to write. The focus is on making the connections, not on the content, which is the focus in the traditional environment. And so this is where it's open. This is where you can start really developing a community of inquiry. It's unlimited. And it's interesting because um, this whole development with MOOCs, you know, I, I actually, this is my second experience in a MOOC. I took my first MOOC uh, just last month. And um, it took me a while to get used to it. You know, I tell you, it's a different way of learning. And I've noticed some comments in this MOOC here, you know, people saying, I'm confused. I don't know where to do this. Um, you know, where do I post this? Because we're used to structure. We're used to being told what to do. And then in a MOOC, it's like, well, here are some guidelines. But basically, you decide what you want to look at. And you decide how you want to engage. And you decide how you want to connect. It's a very, very different kind of experience. And so this spectrum that I have here is just something that I've been developing as I'm, I'm writing up uh, my seventh year of doing this kind of research and I'm just trying to think about um, this continuum of personal virtual learning space design you know uh, what kinds of factors might be in play uh, to look at this uh, C MOOCs um, versus X MOOCs very interesting discussion C being connectivist versus X being uh, the kind of MOOCs that we've been seeing coming out of, uh, you know, places like Stanford, Coursera, uh, X Ed, you know, those kinds of different things. So a lot of the discussion out there right now is that uh, X MOOCs are tend typically to be more traditional. So they use, uh, you know, best practices, lectures, uh, videotape lectures, you know, that sort of thing. Whereas the connectivist MOOC is the open-ended one where it's really, as Nellie was saying, about making those connections. It's really about um, open learning, right? Uh, very fascinating. It's an exciting time to be an educator. There's a lot going on out there, you know, and it, it feels chaotic. There's a, you know, frenetic. But this is why we need to use tools like inquiry, uh, MOOCs, engaging connections to really try and make sense of this, to, to really find our tribe, because there are lots of people like us out there uh, who are wanting to make sense of all of this and to figure out, well, how can these develops, developments really improve my practice, help me grow, help my students grow? Uh, it is really rewarding to make connections. It's really empowering. And I'll tell you, 
since I've been, even these MOOC, this MOOC experience, the connections you make, it's really, it's fun. I'm going to end with, uh, for people who are interested in this open education, this is a, a, an article that just recently came out by Irvine and others uh, on multi-access learning. And they uh, define, thank you, Nellie, they define multi-access learning as enabling students in face-to-face -face and or online context to personalize their learning experience while participating in a course. And the reason I thought this was interesting is because it gets you thinking about the different contexts, the possibilities, the modalities that you can use. So in the center for tier one, you've got the traditional face-to-face -face thing that's going on. Tier two is synchronous face-to-face -face and online. So it would be like a blended or a hybrid format where you, um, you might include your online learners by using something like web conferencing. Tier three is what they call the asynchronous dimension, where in those web conferencing, uh, those lectures or those web conferencing sessions, you've archived them and taped them like Nelly does, and then you can access them asynchronously offline, right? And if you're a teacher, you could also include asynchronous uh, activities that your students could be doing. So you're enriching your face-to-face -face, uh, with these online activities. And then the last tier is this world of open learning that we've just been talking about. These MOOCs where everything is open, where maybe you have, uh, there are different versions. I kind of, within a, an educational environment where we have limitations, we're not free to just always do the open MOOC thing. I've been really thinking about this idea of having a hybrid course, right, where I have some students for, that are taking the course for credit, but that I open it up to teachers out in the field who might also be interested. You, you enrich and diversify the learning community, and maybe those people, you make it free and open to them. They're taking it because they're interested. They are what we call those lifelong learners. Right, uh, And when you open it up like that, all of a sudden, just like this MOOC, you can open it up and have connections all over the world and really enrich that learning environment and help your students to make connections with experts out there in the field. Uh, so I think what I like about this article is that they, they first of all, they ground it in some nice learning theory. We always, as our academics, we need to be connecting to uh, our experiences and our and, and our theories and what we've learned from experience, but also um, get you thinking about how you might design your virtual and face-to-face -face learning spaces. What kind of course do you want, right? And that's what mapping out your 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 learning environment is all about. Okay. So, um, I think that that's it. The last slide I have here are just some references that I've pulled together. Excellent. Uh, Absolutely. But other than that, if others Absolutely. have questions or amazing. thoughts. Thank, thank you, Thomas. You so much. Hopefully this I've got you thinking about this really does uh, how you do can it. You know, Helena intentionally said, you know, students, create true, your a lot of students are not interested and your face to face with a blend depending on what you're doing. Thank you, Helena. You're welcome. That's it. You know, I've got a life. Thank you, Kamani. I'm not going to go beyond. Wonderful that. to see you all here. This no, has been very uh, exciting. Levels for them, just good. I'm glad to hear that, Nelly. That's, that's exactly what I was degree. hoping for. But it's really not about that. We need to be it's intentional, about the right? And I think that's what these um, live you, meetings Alfonso. are also about. I don't know about you guys, but I made a lot of friends in the chat boxes during the MOOCs. You know, Stephen and George down. Uh, sorry, Stephen. Um, Downs and George Simmons. That's where I met a lot of my friends in the chat box. You know, you share emails and, and that's how it starts. So uh, connections, that's what it's all about. As long as we're people and not robots, I guess. Yeah. 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 We have to understand our students have been brought up in a system where that's how they perform. You know, we can't expect them to change overnight, just like we don't change overnight. We need to be open and um, we need to take them on that journey because at the end of it, so many of them mm -hmm. get it. They go, yes, I know this is so much more interesting, but it's hard to break old paradigms. Right? It's, 
very hard to tell someone. I always yeah. get scared when people. Helena says, just tell them to do it. It's it's conceptual shift. We have to we have to understand our students have been brought up in a system where that's how they performed. You know, we can't expect them to change overnight, just like we don't change overnight. We need to be open and um, we need to take them on that journey because at the end of it, so many of them get it. They go, yes, I know this is so much more interesting, but it's hard to break old paradigms, right? It's very hard to break the mold. I always get scared in teacher preparation when I have those students because I think if this is how you see your program, what kind of teacher are you going to be when you go out there and all you're worried about is delivering content? It makes me feel yeah, sad. Lots of patience, that, um, Helena and everyone. You know, I'd like to be part of the change to create you have to uh, a, a what learning you're experiences and, and students that are rich um, for our future, follow. for students, kids out there in the field. And so we have to start in higher ed. We have to start doing it with them. Absolutely, that's, that's the hope, is that, you know, once you model it, then they'll realize that's what learning should be. And it doesn't mean that we never do the old stuff. There's a time and a place, but it doesn't have to be everything, you know, definitely not. And when I look at my practice now, I can't even imagine how I would go back. I, I, I can't, I think my neural pathways have changed. I just don't think I could go back because the one thing technology helps to Organized. I agree, Andres. It's so hard to go back to traditional once you go this way. And when I think about it, and some, I saw it fly by in the chat too, somebody saying something about it being time consuming. It's very time consuming, especially up front. But then over the years, you right, save like time once you get established. And um, when I look yeah, at my and, practice now, I can't even continue. imagine how I would go back. Okay, I, I, I can't. Here's the I link, think my neural so pathways have changed. I just don't think I could go this. back because, for one thing, okay, technology invite, helps to keep uh, me organized. And you know, and it's just. Uh, this is Nellie. It's not Anita. It's, I cannot it. I imagine going back computer. to just traditional but there it is. There's the link. I use technology now we're two in everything, people, even you can my only do this fully with technology, face technology, right? I mean, two of us are speaking, yet one person's name is appearing in the chat box. Imagine that. All right. So uh, go into that link, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so and uh, we'll continue the um, discussion. Thank you so much for coming, uh, for joining this session. Thank you, Anita, for offering us so much your time, your expertise. Um, I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks. <laughs> yeah.